Good morning and welcome to our service of worship here at Haddonfield United Methodist Church. Uh, I welcome you in the spirit of God who has created all living beings and has called us God's beloved children. Today, as we gather uh, virtually to worship God and to be into connection with one another, uh, it is Pentecost Sunday, which is traditionally uh, lifted up as the birthday of the church. It goes back to the story in the book of Acts, in which God's spirit breathed upon the disciples, and they were able to then go out into the streets and to preach good news, a message of hope and God's love through Jesus Christ to people who had gathered from different nations. And those people were able able to hear for the first time that good news in their own tongue, in a language they understood. Today we celebrate Pentecost as a sending forth of the church to meet people where they are and to speak hope and love and peace in their own language. Today, as we begin to meet each other where we are, I want to acknowledge that uh, our nation is being pulled at the fabric and that many of us have heavy hearts because all that has happened in the last week, uh, let alone the last several months, as we mourn the loss of loved ones, as we mourn the loss of regular rhythms, but especially this week in the face of injustice, in the face of uh, uh, racial discord, and really things that pull at our relationships with one another. And I want us to begin this time together by saying that in Christ, there is no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free. We are all welcome as beloved children of God. And my prayer is that there is something for everyone in this service. Each of you, each of us are God's children, and we are welcome together to be a part of this community. Throughout this service, we're going to have an opportunity to pray for uh, some of the unrest and, and many of the things that weigh our hearts down. And we'll also look in the proclamation of the Acts story, how God can work in a moment like this and what we can do as uh, steps forward. I want to invite us uh, to engage in the life of this church through just a few announcements briefly. On Thursday, here in the parking lot of our church, we are going to have a drive-through parade in which we invite folks to come at 6.45 in the evening and line up. At 7 o'clock, we'll be able to drive around in a circle and to greet the graduating high school seniors of this church and to wish them well. Normally, this would be an in-person celebration and worship, and this year we're going to do it um, by having folks remain in their cars, but the seniors will stand outside, um, spaced apart from one another, and they'll get to be greeted by each of us who gather. Each week, we offer different classes and opportunities to connect in our spiritual life. Um, Pastor Jisun leads a Lectio Divina time on Wednesday mornings at 9 o'clock, and that is a reading and rereading of Scripture so that it may settle into our minds. I encourage you to check that out. On Thursday mornings at 8 o'clock, I have a time of centering prayer, which is a more of a quiet time, a, a silent prayer together. And, um, and then there are other small groups that are in existence and we are starting new connect groups. If you are interested in any of these opportunities, please reach out at office at haddonfieldumc.org and you can go deeper and be a part of our community. One of the great ways in which we have been able to continue to be the church in a hurting world is through our mission and outreach uh, efforts. And so I want to invite you to watch this video, which is my closing announcement. And I pray that you can continue to support our efforts. But I give God thanks and I'm grateful to each person who has, who has supported our food drive and our mass collection. Let's see what we as a community and each of you in our congregation have been able to do so far. Today we are taking 286 items to the Cherry Hill Food Pantry. Since March, we have now collected 3,733 items. We are all packed and ready to go to the Cherry Hill Food Pantry. My name is 
is Janet and I'm with the Cherry Hill Food Pantry. Right now, because of COVID, we are in experiencing a large increase. We moved a number of months ago and our plans were to renovate our building to make it acceptable for our clients to come in and shop as they did. I would graciously ask you to consider a donation of funds or material or time. Hi kids, today we're going to be talking about the wind. And to show you a little bit about the wind, I brought this wind vane, which can point to the direction that the wind is blowing. This wind vane was made by a dear friend of ours, but we're going to show you today how you can make your own wind vane at home. So first you get an empty container and then you put rocks on the bottom and then you cut out pieces of uh, cardboard into triangles and then you will and then you write like three like four letters and they're the symbols of places is N for north, S for south, um, E for east, and W for west. And then you poke a hole in the middle of the container. First, you get a composable straw, then you cut out some cardboard shapes, and then you glue it to the straw, forming an arrow. Then you stick a push pin and, and to the straw to attach it to a pencil. As you can see, you get uh, we reinforced our arrow with some tape. Now you are ready to place the arrow into the container or and then and use a compass or ask a grown-up up to get a compass app to who to always make sure that the end is pointing north. The wind reminds us of the Holy Spirit. Just as the wind directs this arrow, God's Spirit can direct our actions based upon what we believe. What good things can you do this week based upon your beliefs to help spread God's love in the world? Think about that and we'll see you next, next week. week. Good morning. Please join us in our call to worship. Come Holy Spirit, inspire our hearts with your fiery presence. Let your flame burn within us, stirring us to action. Come Holy Spirit, energize our lives to work for God. Let your wind of hope swirl around us, lifting and moving us from complacency. Come Holy Spirit, Pour your blessing on us. Let your presence challenge us to proclaim God's presence and love in everything we say and do. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Good morning, church. I'm so glad we are here together to worship our God on this Pentecost Sunday as we wait for the Holy Spirit coming down to us, touching our hearts, and bringing new hope and peace into our lives. As a community of faith, we lift up our hearts, our prayer, because prayer is an expression of our faith. And without faith, we, it's impossible to please God. And whether our hearts are heavy or weary, a burden, or joyful, the good news is that God welcomes us here as we are. And God is ready to listen to us. On the first Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down to them, the disciples started to speak the new languages they've never learned before. Isn't it amazing? As a person who speaks English as my second language, I know it's something impossible thing to happen. And I really hope we encounter God, God's presence in surprising and a fresh ways in this morning. These days we go through this pandemic, global pandemic together, and we face the hidden problems of society are getting floated like systematic problems, racial injustice, and unspoken prejudices deeply rooted in the culture. And I want us to lift up our prayers for the victims and the families from violence, injustice, and inequality because of our skin colors or, or any other conditions. The truth we remember today is each of us matters so much to God. And none of us are more important or less important in God's eyes. So we, I pray for everyone who feels insecure in this crisis. And I hope we find inner peace in God, regardless of the circumstances around us. So would you please join me in prayer? God of love and God of mercy, we give thanks to you for this new day given us, to love you and to worship you. We give our best and thanksgiving for everything in our lives because you are the author of life and the source of goodness of everything. Today we remember the first Pentecost when you sent your spirit to us and we know that your spirit is not a thing but a person and we welcome you Holy Spirit. Come and start new things in our hearts, in our lives, in our family, in our community, and in our world. And we are stumbling for unexpected consequences of COVID-19. Our hearts are broken to see unrealistic numbers of confirmed cases and death every day. Because it's not just number, but each number means a person, someone's beloved one. Please be the comforter and peace for the families who lost their beloved ones in this season, not only due to this virus, but many other causes as well. We pray for doctors and nurses standing in the front line, essential workers taking a risk to provide services for us. We pray for the vulnerable population, for their physical and emotional safety and health, especially our families living in a nursing home. We pray for those who lost their jobs and experiencing severe economic impacts. We pray for those who are fighting for their lives. Oh Lord, hear our prayers and have show your mercy on us. We give you thanks for gradual healing and progress on our family members and friends who are struggling with health problems. And we ask you to continue to work on them. Please stretch your healing hands and release your grace for those who are suffering from various illness. Please provide your good care through the people around them and bring your new hope and peace each day in new ways that transcending our knowledge and experiences. Oh Lord, make us one in Christ. Let us walk humbly, lovingly, and justly in this journey. Open our eyes to see the reality but not overwhelmed by it. Rather, help us become the voice of your love, hands and feet of your care in and beyond the community. And invite us into deep relationships with you and draw us closer to you. And please continue your good works in and through us that you started already long before 
even we were formed in our mother's womb. We pray in Jesus' name, which revealed to us who you are and who we are, and as we continue to pray with the word Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Please join us in a Psalter reading of Psalm 104, found in the United Methodist Hymnal. The words will be on your screen. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, and cover yourself with light as with a garment. You have stretched out the heavens like a tent, and have laid the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot, and ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundation, so that it would never be shaken. You cover it with the deep as with a garment, the waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took flight. They rose up to the mountains, ran down to the valleys, to the place which you appointed for them. You set a bound which they shall not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys, they flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field, the wild asses quench their thirst. Above the springs, the birds of the air have their nests, they sing among the branches. From your lofty place you water the mountains. With the fruit of your work, the earth is satisfied. O oh Lord, how manifold is your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there, living things both small and great. There go the ships, and leaveeth in whom you form to play in it. These all look to you, to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it. When you open your hand, they are fulfilled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to the Lord in whom I rejoice. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise, praise the, the Lord. Lord.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound, like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Alamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? mean? But the others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Tired, exhausted, sleep-deprived. These are some of the terms I hear from friends and family, and members of our congregation, that describe how they have felt over these last few months of being sheltered at home. Not having the ability to go to work or to go to restaurants or places of gathering, but simply staying home and watching TV or working from home or whatever the rhythm may be. I hear time and time again from folks how worn out they are. All these things, tired, exhausted, and chronically sleep deprived. Well, that doesn't make any sense on its face, does it? Because you would think that being so busy, leaving our homes early in the morning, uh, doing all of the tasks we normally, normally would do, whether it's work or meeting friends or getting things done, running from place to place in our busy lives, you would think that that is what exhausts us. And so the ability to stay home for a few months and not have to go out, it doesn't make sense that that is what would have folks feeling so tuckered out. Well, actually reading up on this subject, it makes a lot of sense. We are creatures of habit and people of rhythm. It is the very rhythm of our day that feeds us, that gives us energy, the gathering with people, knowing we have some place to go, for the, rather, the regular things that we do day in and day out energize us as well as deplete us, and they put us in cycles that perhaps help us to sleep at night. Not having those cycles or rhythms or things to look forward to, rather where the days and the, the evenings and the mornings bleed into one another, we have a loss of cycle. And for many people, a loss of ability to sleep and to feel rested. Zoom fatigue 
is a very interesting phenomenon that I have heard a lot of and even have experienced myself. Zoom fatigue is similar, um, where one would think on its face that it is easier to look at a screen and meet with people than ha have to get in your car or walk somewhere and sit in a room for several hours and then go back home. Many people instead who are working from home or who are using the internet platform Zoom to hold different types of meetings, and we hold them here at the church, Bible studies and other gatherings through Zoom, you would think that it is easier to stay home and connect. But the studies show us that there are other reasons why people feel so exhausted after staring at a screen. According to the Harvard Business Review and other publications, Zoom fatigue makes perfect sense because it alters the way that we gather and it alters the way that we show up and are present, whether it is for a class in school or whether it is for a meeting at work, whether we are connecting with friends and family or even a part of a Bible study. Think about how we would normally gather in person we would come in, we would get to greet people, and we would sit down. Now, we have to pay attention for very long periods of time in ways that otherwise we could look around the room. We could check in and check out. We could read things by body language. We could whisper to our friend uh, to catch us up on what we missed. And now if you use platforms like Zoom or others to stay connected, we have to hyper-focus for long periods of time. The Harvard, uh, the Harvard Business Review calls it the constant gaze, that folks are engaged in a constant gaze, lasting up to an hour or more, depending how long the meeting or gathering is, in which we are fixed on a subject, and we can't really move our gaze. That in itself could cause brain fatigue, mental fatigue, and other types of exhaustion. Also, um, when we are looking at a screen, it is easy for folks to multitask in ways that we couldn't otherwise. On a screen, we can check our email, and the folks on the other end at Zoom of our Zoom chat don't necessarily know that we are checking our email or doing something else or reading the news or whatever it may be. So then, even more so, our minds become divided in their attention, putting more stress and uh, to the constant gaze. Another factor I think that can lead to Zoom fatigue uh, that, that it is easy to overlook this little important detail is that when you are on a Zoom conference call, you can see yourself the entire time. Well, no matter how vain we may or may not be, when I'm in an in-person meeting, I think if I was mentally aware of how I looked every minute of the gathering, I would probably sit up more straight. I would probably make sure that everything was straightened out a little bit more. But in in-person meetings, we lose attention to our own appearance and affix our gaze on whatever it is we are paying attention to. But when we gather virtually, not only do we have a constant gaze on the faces, on the screen, not only are we also possibly um, multitasking and doing other things, we also are hyper aware of our own image, of how we are presenting, of how others see us. So many people uh, make sure that they put an interesting background behind them. I find myself constantly straightening up and moving so that the better side or the better lighting can be seen. In any way, this very interesting uh, season and time in which we are seeking um, to the, the health and safety of all people, we have been forced to stretch our own imaginations and our own abilities to continue to gather with people, to work, to be a part of church, to do many other functions of life. And um, this is one of the results that we realize what we have taken for granted. The 
luxuries that were afforded to us and in-person gatherings. And I think one of the lessons that we can learn, I'm constantly asking myself, what will we and can we learn? What are we learning from this time? One of the things I think that we can learn from this season is what is essential? What is essential to gathering? Is it being in the same place? Is it sharing a building? I think many companies will look differently on how they allow folks to work from home. On the other side of this, many churches already are planning to to grow their online presence on the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are being forced to ask ourselves, what was a luxury, things that we took for granted, and what is essential to our being? What do we need? need. Well, the essential nature of the church is what the the second chapter of Acts is all about. Pentecost, or the Greek word Pentecosti, literally means 50 days. And it was a Jewish festival marking the end of a 50-day period after the Passover. So this would have been um, about a month and a half after uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. If we remember, he went to Jerusalem to celebrate with the, pa- the Passover with his disciples when he had the Last Supper and then was subsequently arrested. And so on Pentecost, the uh, Jews from the surrounding areas would have gathered back in Israel and been there for this festival marking the end of a 50-day period. And there the disciples were gathered and other followers of Jesus were gathered where they were waiting. When Jesus ascended, he told them to go to Jerusalem and pray and wait. Wait for God's spirit that would breathe upon them and give them the next steps, if you will. And there they were faithfully gathering and singing and praying and and, uh, uh, strengthening their own communion with each other. And all of a sudden, as the second chapter says in Acts, all of a sudden it was like a rush of wind, an audible sound, and God's Spirit began to move among them. The next scene is uh, a peculiar and yet interesting one where the disciples are in the streets speaking words that they were not taught. They are beginning to preach and proclaim what the people say are the mighty works of power of God. But it's not in their own dialect. It's not in Aramaic, as Jesus would have spoken and his disciples would have spoken. But it was in the specific and particular languages of the people who happened to be in that area of Jerusalem. There's a long list. I always feel sorry for the people who are reading the the, uh, scripture on Pentecost Sunday because it is a long list of different peoples and cultures that are gathered there. And yet it is in the language of each of those people that the disciples were, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, able to proclaim the good news of God's mighty works of power. The word gospel literally means good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the story that through Jesus, through his life, his death, and his resurrection, he was able to bring hope and reconciliation, and healing, and a way of life that would unite people. And that story was good news. The disciples, because of the rushing of God's breath, they began to speak in words that were understood by many. In in that story, even one of the people who heard said, how is it? that these Jesus followers who were all from Galilee, how were these who are Galileans speaking in my dialect, my tongue, my language? There were people from all over, including Rome and throughout uh, the ancient Near East. And they were amazed that these folks were not speaking in a universal language, but they were actually speaking in specific and and in, in many ways, perhaps, marginalized languages. I think this story contains the essentials of the church, the essential story. Let's review. 
the disciples following Jesus' words were gathered, strengthening the bonds of their fellowship and of their communion. They were lifting their hearts in prayer. They were waiting for God, but they also were giving God thanks for what God was already doing. And then God uh, greeted and met them through the presence of the Spirit and through the marriage of their willingness and their fellowship and the breath of God, they were able to go out into the streets, into the world where people were hurting and needed good news. And they met them where they were, meaning they spoke in their own language, in ways they would understand that felt like home. The disciples met those people where they were and offered them good news. They didn't ask the strangers to adopt their line of thinking, didn't ask them to understand in their own language, but instead met them where they were. In many ways, that's really where the church is today. We are reminded of the luxuries that we have enjoyed. The luxuries of common buildings, of equipment, of organs, of pianos, of stages, even the ability to stand in the same room with one another. We have had the luxury of dinners and stories and common culture and programs and studies and all the things that church means to us. Groups of friends, activities, activities, programs, and yet in this moment, the church continues to be open, but in a different way. And so we are called to examine what is essential to being the church. What is on this day, the birthday, what is essential to being a part of the body of Christ? The Pentecost story gives us the blueprint that we are to be people who strengthen our bonds of fellowship in person or virtually. People to join our hearts and our spirits and our minds and our words in prayer, strengthening our communion with God, but also ready and willing to go when God's Spirit says go. The church at its essence has always been and is still today not a people gathered, but a people sent, or gathered and then sent. The church today has the opportunity to meet the world and the needs of the world with the good news of the mighty things that God has done, is doing, and will continue to do in the world. On this day, Pentecost Sunday, our world is deeply hurting. Before this weekend, there was much to preach about. The pandemic plans to reopen our buildings, but in the last few days, uh, more than 30 cities have seen protests and riots in the United States um, uh, on the backdrop of George Flynn's uh, death uh, at the knee of a police officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And this was not uh, by any stretch of the imagination, an isolated event. Of course, it comes on the heels of the death of Breonna Taylor, an EMS worker, and Ahmad Arbery, um, a guy who was uh, jogging in Georgia and who was shot by citizens. Um, this, uh, these have been symptoms of a greater disease in our country that has lasted over 300 years. The roots go deep. And, uh, and while they are not, um, in many ways, anything that uh, an individual could say we started, they are our responsibility to name and to seek healing and justice and an end to such things. Today, I know that people are hurting in this country and around the world. People who are worried for their sons and for their daughters, for their siblings, for themselves. There are people who feel threatened. That uh, There are people who feel that others are going too far and how protests happen. And today, 
what I want to say is that we must see this not as an issue of any one community, but an issue for humanity and every person. Because uh, as a friend of mine once said, if one part of the body of Christ hurts, the entire body of Christ hurts. Think if you've dropped something on your foot, it doesn't matter that your hand feels okay. All that you can feel is the pain emanating from your foot. And today, part of our human community and part of the body of Christ is deeply hurting and we should all feel that pain and we should all work and seek the healing, the restoration, the reconciliation, and the justice. And I want to just take a moment and, and name something that is often uncomfortable and painful, particularly for Caucasian folks like myself to name. And that is the ability to care about an issue hinges on privilege. For some people, we'll see what's happening in Minnesota and around the United States and, and, and say, I need to stop reading the news, or I want to tune out, or I don't want my preacher to talk about that in church, or find ways to tune out. The ability to not care about issues of racial injustice is a sign of privilege, a privilege that we can float in and out of caring about such an issue. For my own family members, for my colleagues and friends and siblings in the church and beyond who are people of color, this is never a luxury. No matter what their education may be, no matter what their position may be, simply because of the color of their skin, they will always be identified by that first, and that is a lack of privilege. Until we can name that as a starting place, we are always talking past, over, and through one another, and not with and along with one another. Today, in this Pentecost Sunday, our country is in many ways literally burning and deeply hurting, and the world is hurting. And I feel that if we have ever needed good news, there is no greater, no more emergent, and no more important time, at least not in my lifetime, than this moment. And it also seems like one of the hardest moments to have meaningful dialogues because we are distant, and to do so fatigues us. Perhaps the timing is right for us to remember what is essential, that the church is not for people to gather separately in safe neighborhoods and in safe buildings or where we are separated and divided by our culture or by our melodies or rhythms or the things that keep us different. But we are in many ways forced into a different kind of gaze in which we cannot look away and we should not look away. The job of the church is to meet people where they are and to speak in a language of love that they understand the best, a native language for them. Today, I feel our charge, um, whether we are in person or virtually, as the church is to be such a church. Gathered, wonderful. Sent, that's the most important thing. That by following Christ, we have to keep pace with the one who came to free the captives, who came to speak good news and to lift up the poor and to, to, uh, to offer forgiveness and reconciliation for those who were even guilty before the law. Jesus came to unite us in a profound and transformative love. Today, I would love to offer you answers to our nation's problems, and to our world's hurts. But I think the best answer is to find one thing that we can do to walk in the right direction.
And in the next uh, few days and weeks, I'm going to be sending out some announcements about events that we will be organizing through our church. One of the first steps that we're going to take is I'm going to organize a panel discussion on, on race and racial justice and how we can best be advocates and siblings with one another, seeking wholeness for all people. I've already been in dialogue with a few folks who are going to help me with that. So please stay tuned for an announcement for dialogue around that. And um, all are welcome to be a part of that. We are also going to um, continue to support uh, all those who are, are in need. And, and we're going to seek to address food insecurity in this area, which also too often falls along racial ethnic lines. And we are going to continue to find um, the next best steps forward so that we can acknowledge each human being as a creation of God and a sibling in Christ. For Paul wrote, in Christ there is no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free, for we are all one. And if one part of the body is hurting, the whole part of the body is hurting. Today, I'm glad that you are part of the body of Christ and that I have the privilege to be a part of the body of Christ. And while we can gather, we are sent and we can go in the way that we listen, work, and walk with one another. This is not the ending. This is the beginning, the birthday of the church. May we be the church, Christ's church in a hurting world. I'm grateful that you are a part of this journey. Amen.
As the Apostle Paul wrote, in Christ there is no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free. The things that have separated human beings from one another over history and throughout time do not divide us in the eyes of God. And through the person of Jesus Christ, as we seek to follow Christ, we are required to take up our own cross and to lay down our own burdens. And part of that sometimes is to carry the weight and the burden of one another. And when one part of the body is hurting, the whole body is hurting. So this day, may we be emboldened, may we be encouraged, and may we be strengthened by knowing that we don't have to have the answers ourselves, but we are called to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So as we go, let us love justice and let us love mercy and let us walk humbly with our God and with our neighbors. And may we go in any way, any small way, and in all ways. May we seek to be the church, the body of Christ, in a hurting world. May we meet people where they are and proclaim good news in words and in ways that they will hear and understand. Let us go and be the church. Amen.